Okay, so uh, actually it took a little more time than I thought I would, but that's okay. So I'm just going to do random processes today, and then I'll do questions, and then I'll leave the noise analysis till Wednesday, because that, there's not that many slides here. So I, I will, either way, I'm going to finish, I'm going to finish this week, okay? So uh, let's get back to this. So um, so far, we're going to, now we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to go back to planet communication systems for a little bit. Okay, so what we've seen so far, when you, especially when you take a look at, uh, you know, transmission of AM modulation and single sideband and, you know, FM and all that, we've assumed so far that when we transmit over communication channels, there's absolutely no noise. It's pretty clean, all right? So what we've dealt with so far is that we've assumed that we're transmitting with absolutely no noise interfering with your message. Okay, but it, unfortunately, that's not the case if you actually get into uh, industry or if you get into an actual a practical setting. You know, uh, usually in an urban environment such as this one, or even if you're on the street, there are multiple sources that will try to contaminate your signal or even leak into your communication channel if you want. Such things as radio signals, you know, cell phone signals. There's even the 60 hertz lighting that'll screw up your, you know, that'll screw things up. Even when you're talking, or you know, anything that any unwanted signals that you don't want to be part of your actual message or you want it don't want to be you don't want it to be part of the actual channel is what's known as noise okay so these actually contribute to noise and they actually leak into either your signal or your communication channel so we have to you know we have to do our analysis or do our uh, uh, you know design to factor noise into account okay so the, the model that we're going to take a look at just for this course, it's one of the most simplest. It's what's known as an additive white Gaussian noise model. Okay, so it's been shown that um, for most noise that is seen in practice, and for all intents and purposes in this course, we're only going to deal with this kind of model. It's what's known as the additive white Gaussian noise or the AWGN model. Okay, so in this course, we're only going to consider this model. And what's special about this is that it is uncorrelated, which kind of makes sense. You would expect noise to be uncorrelated. What that means is that if you take a look at the autocorrelation function, you'd expect it that it should be only similar with itself, right at the same time points. As you start to move away from your specified time points, so let's say your t is equal, let's say two seconds, as soon as you drift away from the two seconds, you'd expect that the random variables that are defined between those two time points, you'd expect them to be zero, like there's no similarity at all. So this is special because there's actually no correlation between when you sample your points at time one and if you sample your points at time two, except for when the time points are exactly the same, okay? There is such thing as correlated noise, but that's actually a separate topic, and we're not gonna talk about that. That's actually a harder case, and if you do decide to take communications in fourth year, then you will talk about correlated noise, but we're not gonna talk about it in this course. Okay, so what, exa what, is it, what exactly does this particular thing mean? I've already talked about it, but let's actually formally define it, okay? So when you examine a corrupted signal over a period of time, uh, noise will usually exist and in our particular case we're only going to talk about additive noise okay so noise in this case is usually additive where you have your original signal and then you got some noise that is compounded on top of the actual signal that's what it means by additive is you're adding noise on top of the original signal so what's cool about this not cool but what's uh, a little um, screwed up about this is that every time you look at different points in time in this corrupted signal you're going to get a different noise profile you, obviously it's noise right so if you take a look at uh, you know your signal between you know time points you know one and two right and then if you look at more time points between you know time points three and four the noise signal that you see between those two time points are not going to be the same so that's why it's uncorrelated here so if you, you know, so for every time point that you, you know, for every, you know, pair of time points that you're seeing, you have this corrupted, you know, you have this noisy profile, noisy signal. So if you collect every single possible pair of time points and you collect them all together, you get all these, you know, noisy signals, this whole entire combination of different noisy signals will actually give you a random process. So just think about it very carefully. Okay. So if you look at all these noisy signals at different time instances, you can actually see that we can actually create random variables at each of these, you know, time points, and you can actually create an autocorrelation function for those, all right? So this is just a nice diagram, and just to give you an explanation of what I'll be talking about next. Uh, so this, you know, the autocorrelation function for an additive white Gaussian noise model is only going to show you similarity with itself right at the time lag of tau is equal to zero, and basically it's going to be zero elsewhere. Okay, so you can think of the autocorrelation function for an additive white Gaussian noise as just having a single impulse that's defined at zero. It's going to be some, you know, some similarity value, and then every other time point, you know, every other time lag that is except for zero is going to be zero. There's no similarity. So you can think of that as just having an impulse function where it's defined right at zero and it's zero everywhere else. Okay, so the top right here is the autocorrelation function of that noise. The top left here is just a random noise signal. So this is generated with, uh, you know, with a Gaussian distribution of the leave of uh, sigma is equal to one, and there's a mean of zero, 
So that gives you, you know, you know, that gives you basically a, uh, you know, a, a noisy signal. And then the bottom left here shows you what the PDF of that signal is. So remember, Gaussian is kind of like bell shaped. So if you actually took these points and created a probability density function, in this case, it's a sample probability density function. You see that it's kind of Gaussian shaped. Okay, so the time points here are between. So in this case, there's 100 samples, and then we have the amplitude on the left side. And the PDF here will tell you, you know, the probability or likelihood that you see a particular amplitude at that point in time. So you'll see that a lot of the amplitudes are concentrated around zero, which makes sense. And that gives you the fact, you know, there, there's, you know, you, know, the, you will the highest, you know, not highest, but you will most likely with high, you know, with relatively high probability that when you have these points, if you put them into a bin, if you picked one out at random, you should expect it to see zero. Okay, so that's what's happening over here. And then if you took the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function, you get the power spectral density, and the Fourier transform of a impulse is a constant. Okay? This constant here, which is n of 0 over 2, it's a well-defined constant, and this is experimentally found. And I'll talk about this in a little bit. But it's been shown that the power spectral density of an additive light Gaussian noise model has a constant height of n over 2 for all frequency values. All right? So recall that the power spectral density is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. So if you have a single impulse for the autocorrelation function, if you take the Fourier transform, the output is going to be a constant, right? So that's just from going back from standard Fourier transform tables. So for noise, in this particular case for noise, the power spectral density actually tells you how much of each frequency component in your signal is going to be corrupted by noise, okay? So the adam white gaussian noise model is special because for every single frequency component that is in the actual spectrum, it gets corrupted by a height of, I'm sorry, it gets corrupted by some, uh, it gets corrupted by noise with a constant height of n0 over 2. So for every single frequency component that is seen in your, you know, in your, in your signal, it gets added or it gets corrupted by, usually on average, by some, you know, height of n0 over 2. So that's usually what, you know, that's usually what it tells us. So here are some practical, here are some practical considerations when you're actually taking a look at the additive like Gaussian noise model or the AWGN model. All right. So usually this constant n of zero is found experimentally. It's usually 10 to the minus 10. So it's actually quite small if you think about it. But it's, it's so this constant is usually about you know 10 to the minus 10. So in practice, what you're doing is when you're doing noise analysis, where you're actually considering uh, the, the noise model, you only take a look at a particular range of frequencies of interest. Usually the range is spanning the bandwidth of your signal. Right. Usually you just look at a range corresponding to the band bandwidth of interest that you want, and because the AWGN, what it does is that it theoretically corrupts all frequency components. So if you wanted to try to uh, you know, recreate this noise model in practice, it's actually unrealizable. So it's actually theoretically not possible. So that's why you restrict the noise analysis to be within a certain bandwidth, which is associated with the bandwidth of your signal. All right. Okay, so this is the next topic I'm going to talk about. So this is what happens if you actually have a random process and you actually transmit it through an LTI system. So it's a little messed up, but we're just go with me here and uh, we'll see where it goes. Okay, so given some random process, which we call X of T, all right, and its corresponding power spectral density, which we call X of, you know, S, X of F or omega, whichever you want. So our random process here has some associated power spectral density with that random process, all right? So if you were to transmit this random process through a linear time invariant system, it has been shown that if the output random process, which is y, and the output power spectral density at the output of this linear time invariant system, it follows the following relationship, which is at the bottom. So the power spectral density of the output, once you put it through an LTI system, you simply take the magnitude of the impulse response of this LTI system, you square it, and then you just multiply it by whatever power spectral density is coming in. So that applies for f, and that also applies for omega as well. So that theorem I'm not going to prove. It's, it's a very well-known theorem in communication theory and, uh, and random process and probability and all that. So basically, if you have a power spectral density of some random process and if you put it through an LTI system, the output is simply taking your LTI system, whatever the impulse response is, squaring it, finding its magnitude and squaring it, and multiplying by the uh, power spectral density that is coming into the system. Either you can do it in omega or f, it doesn't matter. It's the same result. Okay, that's, that's something that you're just going to have to go by faith with me on here. Okay, so here's a quick example. So let's say I wanted to transmit a random process through an LTI system, and that LTI system happens to be a low-pass filter. All right. So this is the sketch of the frequency response of that LTI system. So in omega, it spans between you know zero to two pi b. So the bandwidth is two pi b. So it actually filters out frequencies between zero and two pi b, the negative as well. And if you want to take a look at it in terms of hertz, it just goes from zero to b. So this is a 
Uh, so we're, we're going to consider the input random process to be an AWGN noisy signal. And then we're going to apply a low-pass filter, and we're going to put this through an LTI system with this response being a low-pass filter, and we want to calculate what that output is going to be. Okay, so let's figure out what the output autocorrelation function is, the output power spectral density, and maybe we can calculate the power too if you want, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So recall that a low-pass filter can be represented with a rect function. Okay, so if you take a look at it in terms of f, we remember that you can represent in this as being rect of f over 2b. So the bandwidth spans from 0 to b, and the bottom is just twice whatever that bandwidth is. So that tells you that it's the, it's the extent from 0 to b. And if you want to take a look at it in terms of omega, it's just 4 pi b. So just take the bandwidth and multiply by 2 pi. All right? So remember that the magnitude of the rect function right, is basically the same. So if you took the magnitude of this, it's just going to give you the same rect function. Okay. Also, if you squared the magnitude, the height is still going to be 1. Right? So if you have a box of height 1 from you know, minus b to b or 2 pi b to 2 pi b or minus 2 pi b to 2 pi b, if you took the magnitude, height's still going to be 1. If you squared it, the height's still going to be 1. Okay? So the magnitude squared is still going to be the same rect function. Okay? So that's what's happening here. So, so I will take my, you know, auto, you know, my power spectral density of the AWGM process, which is n over 2, n over 2 over all frequencies, and then I multiply this by the magnitude squared, which is just the same thing by itself. Okay, so this, this would give you the power spectral density in terms of frequency, right? And then if you wanted to do it in terms of omega, it's the same thing. So all you have to do is just take the, uh, you know, the magnitude squared of the rec function. In this case, it's just omega here. You square it. It gives you the same thing. And then you multiply by whatever the power spectral density is of the input, which is n0 over 2. And that would be your power spectral density of the output. So naturally, actually, let's figure out what the autocorrelation function is now. So it's just the inverse Fourier transform of this, right? So if you remember, uh, this is from your Fourier transform tables, right? So if you wanted to find the inverse Fourier transform of a rect function divided in frequency, so you have a bandwidth from 0 to b, and then it's scaled by a. If you took the Fourier transform, it's just simply 2ab sync 2 pi b, all right? And then if you did it in terms of frequency, it's also the same results. Slightly, it's defined slightly differently. So in this case, instead of 2ab, it's aw over pi, so it's, and then it's sync w. And so instead, you know, so this is defined in terms of f. This is defined in terms of omega. So there's there's two different ways you can do it. So but either way, if you use either one, you can still find what the autocorrelation function is. So if you actually compare between the previous one here, right, this is you know my autocorrelation functions here. So if you take a look on this side, I have two w. So if I let w equal two pi b, two pi b times two will give you four pi b. So if I let w equal two pi b. And this constant a, I'm going to let it be n over 2, because there's a constant outside here, so this becomes a. If I do these substitutions, and if I find the inverse Fourier transform, I get this result. So you actually get both, depending on, it, it's both the same, depending on which domain you use. So this is the autocorrelation function of the output, once you pass it through a low-pass filter. So it's actually a sync function. Let's scale by n0, and then multiply by whatever the uh, bandwidth of the low-pass filter would be. Okay, so how do you actually find the total power? That's pretty simple. The first method is just use the autocorrelation function, substitute n is equal to zero, no, sorry, tau is equal to zero. Sync of zero is one, so it's just n0b. So that would be the power. Now you can actually do it another way. If you wanted to, what you could do is you could find the power spectral density. We've already talked about that, and you can find what the total area is, and that's pretty simple. So all you have to do is this is the, you know, this would be what the output would look like, right? So what you're doing is you are uh, you have your low-pass filter, and then what you're doing is you're putting a low-pass filter between minus b and b, or minus 2 pi b and 2 pi b, and then because the low-pass filter's amplitude is 1, and then the random process has a height of n over 2, you're scaling by n over 2. So remember that when you're, you want to find the total area, so the area of a rectangle is just simply width times height, right? So the height of this is n0 over 2, and the width is 2 pi b minus minus 2 pi b, which is 4 pi b, or if you want to do it in hertz, b subtract negative b, which is 2 b. Right, so this is just the total area. So it's length times width times the uh, 1 over 2 pi here. If you're taking a look in terms of omega, the 2 pi's cancel out with here. So you have the pi and pi, and then the 4 and the 2 times 2 cancels. So you get n0b. And then you can do the same thing as well in terms of frequency. It's just width times height. So n0 over 2 and then 2b, which is the width here, and then you get n0b. So either way, you can either do either the autocorrelation function or you can find what the area is. Sometimes it's more convenient to calculate the area of the power spectral density rather than the autocorrelation function. Depends on what you, it depends on the circumstance. But this is a very important fact that we'll be using later on uh, in, uh, in uh, Wednesday's, you know, on Wednesday's lecture, because if you want to find what the total power is of a low-pass AWGN process, it's simply N0B. So this is something that we're going to be using later on in the course.
Okay, so now we're going to talk, the last topic we're going to have is uh, bandpass random processes. Okay, so if a power spectral density, so what we've talked about so far is taking your random process and applying a low-pass filter to it. But there's also the case where you can apply a bandpass filter. So instead of putting a low-pass filter in your random process, you have a bandpass filter where it's off from the center, it's centered at some frequency, which is omega c, and then there's a bandwidth of either minus 2 pi b to 2 pi b or b to b, minus b to b. So it's a bandpass filter with a bandwidth of uh, 2b or 4 pi b, depending on which domain you're looking at, and it's away from the origin. Okay, so we're actually going to do a little bit of math. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of derivations here. So you can actually express a bandpass random process, which is xbp of t, in terms of a sum of quadrature components. So you can represent this bandpass random process as xc of t multiplied by cos omega ct and xs of t multiplied by sine omega ct. So xc of t is simply taking your random process, modulating by a cosine wave with a carrier frequency omega c, and applying a low-pass filter, an ideal low-pass filter. So H0 of t is the response of an ideal low-pass filter. So this is the impulse response and time domain of an ideal low-pass filter. And then Xs of t is take, basically taking your random process, which is x of t, and then multiplying by sine, and then applying a, uh, um, let's see here, a um, low-pass filter to the multiplication of that signal. Okay, so that's basically how you can represent a bandpass process in terms of quadrant components. So how exactly does that work? Like, why does, it, why does this actually work? I'm going to talk about that now. We're actually going to drive this right now. So why does this actually work? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this equation here and we're going to turn it into a block diagram. So we're going to transform this equation into a block diagram. Okay. So this is the block diagram of this equation here. So this equation is transformed into this block diagram. Okay. So note that we have a bunch of different modulators here. So you have cosine and sine and you know there's one that's multiplied by two and there's others that are multiplied by just one. So it's cos is on the top sine is on the bottom, and each modulator has some um, theta or some random, some phase that is uniform, not uniformly distributed, but we assume that the phase terms here are basically all the same, so all these modulators are synchronized. There's no phase drift between any one of them. They all share the same phase, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to put an input into this system that's just a single impulse, and then we're going to see what the output of the system is, which will characterize what the impulse response is. That's what the impulse response is, right? You put in a single impulse into your system, whatever the output is, that output defines what the impulse response is of that system. Okay, so let's figure out what that impulse response is. For, so we're going to use some arbitrary delta function, so it's delta t, and then there's some shift associated to it, which is alpha. So if this is our input, so if the input into here is a delta function or impulse function uh, with some arbitrary shift alpha, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze what the time domain function, functions are for each of these points. We're going to take a look at A1 and A2, B1 and B2, C1 and C2, and finally what the output is at D. So we're also going to take a look at this in terms of time domain, and we're also going to take a look at what it looks like in frequency. I'm also only going to do this in omega to save time using, if you were to change this into F, it's not going to change your analysis. I'm just proving that this represents a band pass random process. Okay, so I'm just going to do it in terms of omega to save us some time. So recall that if you have some sort of impulse response, right? So for example, if I had an impulse response, right? And it's, you know, if I put some impulse in and then uh, it's characterized by H of T. So if I put in a delta, my output will be an H. And it might be scaled by some, you know, um, some scalar A, right? So actually there should be an A here. So this should be A delta T is equal to A H of T. So I'll correct that later. So if you put in an impulse that is scaled, if you were to shift this impulse over by some shift alpha, and then if you scale it by A as well, what you're doing is you're also going to take your impulse response and shift it over by the same shift, which is alpha. Okay, so this is just your standard impulse response. So if you have a uh, delta that's coming in, right, if you were to shift your delta over by some constant alpha, you'd expect that the impulse response would be shifted over by the same amount as well. Okay? Also remember the shifting properties. So if you had some function that was multiplied by some delta term, it's basically equal to substituting alpha where this is equal to zero. So wherever this is defined, so this is telling you that you're shifting your impulse over where the center is alpha. Whatever that shift is, you substitute it into your x and that is the same. So just replace t with alpha and that's the shifting property. So let's actually go through this step, one step at a time. So at point a1, you're going to take your function x of t and multiply by 2 cos omega ct plus theta, which is what's going on here. x of t is delta. Okay? And then if you apply the sifting property, you replace all t's with alpha, and that's what's happening over here. So it's 2 cos omega c alpha plus theta, and then I just move the delta from the left to the right. It's commutative, so that's okay. 
Now, if we take a look at A2, we're going to do the same thing, but instead of cos, it's going to be sine. So you have delta t minus alpha, and then instead of two cos, you get two sine, and then it's omega ct. And then replace all the t's with alpha, and then this is what you get. So you've got two cos omega c alpha at the top, and two sine omega c alpha at the bottom. And notice that the impulses are still there. Okay? So at B1, this is defined as xc of t. So if you remember what xc of t was, it's simply taking x of t multiplied by cos, right? So whatever the input is, you multiply by cos, and then you apply a low-pass filter on top of that. That's what's happening right here, right now. So you take your input, multiply by cos, and then apply a low-pass filter, and that's what's happening over here. So this is what the output of B1 would be. So basically what you're doing, remember this is the uh, shifting the impulse, right? So if my input was A1, right? So if you have two cos and then delta, you just change the deltas to H0, because that's the impulse response for your low-pass filter, and then you're done. Okay? Same thing with B2 as well. So if I have x and then 2 sine, if I put it through a low-pass filter, the deltas change to an h, and you're done here. So that's we're okay here so far. So I've got 2 cos omega c alpha at the top and 2 sine omega c alpha on the bottom, and both of them are scaled by whatever the low-pass filter is shifted over by some time alpha. Okay. Now with C, this is where it gets a little more complicated. So we're going to take the signal at B1, which is xc of t, and we're going to multiply by cos again. So this is what's happening here. So xc of t cos, so x of t is this thing over here that we've talked about. So you have 2 cos omega c alpha plus theta, and then h0 t minus alpha. So that's xc of t. And then you multiply by cos omega c plus theta. But I just, I just rearrange this, so I just swap these two together so that you have this expression. The bottom is essentially the same. So you take b of 2, whatever this is, and you multiply by sine, and this is what you get. So x of s is 2 sine omega c alpha, and then you have h0 t minus alpha. Multiply that omega by sine omega c t, and that's what you get. Okay. Then at D, what's going to happen is that we're going to take the outputs from C1 and C2, and we're going to add them together. So you have this guy, 2 cos omega C alpha, you know, at the top here, and then it gets added with 2 sine omega C alpha at the bottom. Okay. So what's happening here is I can actually do some sort of factory. So if you actually take a look between both of the left and the right terms, there is a common 2 and then H0 T minus alpha term. So that's what's happening over here. So 2 H0 T minus alpha gets factored, and then we have cos cos, so these two coses get factored in, and then you have sine and sine. Okay, so if you take a look, there's a product of a cos and a product of sine, so we can actually use a double angle formula to help us express this and simplify it. Okay, so recall that cos of A minus B is just cos A, cos B, and then sine A, sine B. So if you take a look here, I have cos A, cos B, and sine A, sine B. So if I let A be omega C alpha plus theta, if I, if I let A be that, if I, let, if I let B be omega C T plus theta, if I, you know, if I let this be A and this be B. If I simplify it, I get this guy over here. So if you let A be omega C T plus theta and B be omega C alpha plus theta, if you do, uh, so this means that you're basically just taking A subtract B, and that's what's happening over here. Okay, so you get a common factor of omega C T, and then you factor that out, and you get you know H zero T minus alpha as well. So this tells you that when you put in a single impulse delta T of minus A, the expected output will be this thing over here, so 2 cos of omega ct minus alpha, the nature of 0. So this is what the impulse response will give you. So then if you want to take a look at what it looks like, if you don't put in a shift, just set, just set alpha equal to 0, and then you get this guy. So if you actually take a look, what you're doing is you're taking the ideal low-pass filter, and then you are modulating it with omega ct. So what's happening here is that you have your ideal low-pass filter, and because you're multiplying by cos, you're taking your low-pass filter, you're shifting it to the right by omega c, and shifting it to the left. All right, so that actually gives you a bandpass filter, which is actually pretty cool. So if you recall the modulation property, if you took M of T and multiplied by cos, remember that you are going to modulate. You're going to move to the right by omega C, you're going to move to the left by omega C, and you're also going to scale by a half. So because this is our function here, right, so this is, you know, cos, and then just, so you have your function here that you can consider this as M of T, you know, the ideal low pass field, and this is cos. If I multiply it and if I take the Fourier transform, I can just use the above property. The twos cancel out with the half, so you get this. So what you're doing here is you're simply taking your low-pass filter and then you're shifting it to the right by omega c, which is over here, and shifting it to the left by omega c, and this is what you have over here. So that's what happens. So if you put in any signal, what's going to happen is that you will it'll apply a bandpass filter to that actual signal itself, and this is what you get. So therefore, with any arbitrary signal, you, what you'll get is if you put in some signal x of t, for example, you, will, you can represent it such that it's a product of two terms. So you'll have x of c of t, where it's simply taking your message signal, or whatever signal you want to put in, multiply by cosine, apply a low-pass filter, and then you multiply that by cos again, 
and then you take your signal, which is multiplied by sine, apply a low-pass filter, then apply sine again, and then you can get a band-pass filter that way. Okay, so uh, just a couple more slides, and we'll take a break, and then I'll do some. I'll do. I'll do some tutorial questions. So I actually only have six slides left. So, okay, so I talked about an arbitrary input. So what happens if the input is now a random process? What happens if instead of you know just a message signal, we have a random process instead as the input? So I'm not going to show it to you here. You can go through it yourself and you know and do the derivation yourself. It's actually a little messy, so I'm going to skip this for you. But it can be shown that if your input into this system, this bandpass system, is a random process then what you can do is you can calculate what the power spectral density is right after the low pass filter. So the power spectral density, you know, uh, you know, at uh, B1, which we're going to call S, X of C, right? So X of C is, you know, your quadrature for the first part. You take, if this, your input's a random process, then we can figure out what the power spectral density at B1 is, which we'll call X, X of C. And if you want to figure out what the power spectral density of X of S is, which is at the bottom, we're going to call it S, X of S in terms of omega. What you can show is that the power spectral density is simply taking your original power spectral density that's in the input, you shift it to the left by omega c, shift it to the right by omega c, and then you can just clip it between minus 2 pi b and 2 pi b. I'll do an example for you soon, but this is actually what it talks about. Also, if you want to do it in terms of frequency, you're totally fine. All you have to do is just take your power spectral density, move it to the right by fc, move it to the left by fc, add them all together, so you have two, you're, you're going to have two, one to the right, one to the left, you add them together, and then anything between minus B and B, you cut loose, and that's what you're left with. Okay, so uh, this is just one last fact, I'll do one example, and we'll take a break. Alright, so what about the power of a bandpass random process? So, I won't show this to you here, but it's actually quite simple. So you can actually show that the output power, once you put it through a bandpass uh, filter, if you find the power of the power spectral, if you find the uh, power of the cosine, which is at the top branch of B1, if you find whatever power that is at the random process at that point is, if you also find whatever the power is going in the bottom branch, whatever X of S is, if you actually find either the power at the top or the power at the bottom, it's equal to whatever the power is at the output of the bandpass filter. So in this case, E of X squared of T is the power of the output of the bandpass filter using the random process's input. So this implies that if you wanted to calculate the bandpass random process power, you can just do it by either taking a look at the top branch, which is at the output of the low pass filter, either at B1, or you can take a look at it at B2, or you can take a look at it right at the output. So either one of those three will give you the same answer. Okay, so this is uh, an example. It should be about four more slides, and we'll take a break, and then I'll do some review for you. Okay, so suppose the input into a bandpass filter is an additive white Gaussian noise model. It's a random pro that we've seen before. So what we're going to do is we're going to determine what the power spectral densities are uh, at you know at the, at the top. So x s of uh, x of c. So whatever we're going to figure out what the power spectral density is at the top. Well, so okay, so this is a typo. This should be s x of s. Okay, so I'll correct that and I'll post it. So it's either x of c at the top, x of s or the bottom. And we'll also take a look at what the power spectral density of the bandpass filter output is. So we're going to take a look at all these, and we're going to show that this is actually going to be equal to each other. Okay. So recall that you know this is a theorem that we talked about before. If you wanted to calculate what the power spectral density is at the top of the bandpass filter or at the bottom, you're just taking your original power spectral density, shifting it to the left by omega c, shifting it to the right by omega c, adding them together, and making sure that it's restricted between minus 2 pi v and 2 pi v. And you can also do the same thing for f as well, between minus f and plus f. Okay, sorry, minus b and plus b. So remember, what we're doing is we're doing it for an AWGN random process. So remember that the power spectral density of an AWGN process is n over 2 for all frequencies. So what you're going to do is you have a flat line. Okay, so if you have a flat line that is flat for all frequencies, if you shift it to the right by some amount, that's still going to be a flat line. It doesn't change anything. This is a line that is going from minus infinity to infinity. So if I have a line and if I shift it over by a certain amount, it's going to give you the same line. If I shift it to the right over by the same amount, it's going to still give you the same line. So if I'm basically adding two lines on top of each other, so you're going to have n0 over 2 and then n0 over 2. So if you add those both up together, you get a line of n0, right? Because you have two lines that are shifted, you have one line shifted to the right, one line shifted to the left. It doesn't mean anything, but if you add them both up, you know, the n0 over 2s add up, so you get n0 instead. Okay? Okay so, okay, so this is just summarizing what I talked about before. So what does this equation mean? So you have x, s of c, and then x, s of s. So, you know, what, what does this actually mean for f or omega? So what you, as I talked about, you do the following operation. So you shift the power spectral density to the left by omega c, shift it to the right by omega c, add 1 and 2 together, and then make sure that you cut it off so that's between either minus 2 pi b and 2 pi b, or minus b and b. Okay? So 
this is what it looks like as I talked about. Okay, so as I talked, so you have a flat line going from you know from minus omega c, and then you have a flat line at plus omega c. You add them both up, you restrict the bandwidth, and this is what you get. Okay, so if you want to find the total power, it's very simple. All you have to do is calculate what the area of this guy is. So basically, the area here is just simply what it's width times height. So you have four pi b, which is the width and n0, which is the height. If you want to do it in omega, you got to make sure that there's a 1 over 2 pi here. 2 pi's cancel. But, you know, so, no, sorry, the pi's cancel. you got 4 over 2, which is 2. And this is what your total power will be for a band pass. Okay? You can also, sh you know, also it's the same thing. You know, you know it's, uh, if you wanted to show for the top, you know, x of c, we can also do the same thing for x of s as well, right? So, you know, the top and the bottom, it's still going to give you the same answer. You can also do this in terms of f. So there's no 1 over 2 pi here, but the width is going to be 2b, and the height's going to be n0, and that's basically just the area of that. So either one of them is going to give you the same result. And this is my last slide for you. So you can also double check to see that the area that you get, if you take a look at the output of your bandpass filter, it should give you the same result as well. So this is what the output would look like if you had your AWGN process and if you put a bandpass filter on that process. So basically what's going to happen is that you're going to have two windows between minus B and B that's centered at F of C, uh, you know, on the left and the right, or between minus 2 pi B and 2 pi B, which is centered at omega C. So this is what the bandpass filter of your AWGN process is going to look like then all you have to do now is just figure out what the total area is. Okay, so if you want to do it in terms of omega, it's very simple. Just figure out what this area is here. So the width here is 4 pi b. The height here is n n0 over 2, which is the first term over here. And then you have this next term, which is basically the same as the other one. So I'm just going to add these two together. And what's going to happen is that the n0 over 2 is add up, so you get n0. You have 4 pi b divides by 2 pi, so you get 2 n0 b, which is what we talked about before. And if you want to do it in terms of f, again, it's very simple. You just go between, you know, the height, you know, the width here is 2 b, the height is n0 over 2. You have the first term here, the second term is also the same thing, n0 over 2, the width is 2 b, and you add them up, you know, the, uh, and then, you know, the n0 over 2s add up to be n0, and then you have 2 b here, and that's what you get. And that's basically it. Okay, so that is pretty much, uh, all the probability and random processes stuff you need to know for this course. And then uh, I'm going to end here. We'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll do some tutorial questions. And then I'll finish the course on Wednesday when we talk about noise analysis. Okay, so let's take a break.